I'd like to take a minute for a call me to order and give you a moment for silent prayer and or reflection. Amen. And now, if you will uh, join with me after roll call, then I get roll call done first. Here. 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 Come and stand and do our pledge of allegiance. We'll play back at that later. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, can I get a motion to review and accept the agenda? I move that we accept the agenda as listed. I'll second. Yes. 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 We're going to start with our item three, which is action items. Back to you. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. It is recommended that the governing board approve the appointment of John Gordy Hall as the principal of Thunderbolt Middle School. Mr. Hall grew up in Lake Havasu City and graduated from Lake Havasu High School. He graduated from NAU in 2008 with a bachelor's in business administration and in 2009 with a master's in secondary education. Gordy first realized his passion for teaching when he worked as a parks and recreation leader. He began his career as a teacher at Thunderbolt Middle School in 2010, where he also coached basketball and other sports for Thunderbolt. He moved to Texas in 2014, where he has served in the San Marcos School District as a middle school teacher, K-8 instructional coach, and most recently as the assistant principal for Doris Miller Middle School. Gordy is passionate about rigorous curriculum and instruction that is differentiated to provide all students with access to a quality education. He believes that collaboration is the key to creating impactful change for students. All stakeholders must play an active part at Thunderbolt Middle School, a place where staff, students, parents, and community members feel welcomed, heard, and a part of the decision-making process. In addition to his work with staff implementing strategies to improve student performance and close achievement gaps, Gordy has led teams with a variety of stakeholders to address attendance concerns, school-wide discipline, safety measures, and the return to campus during the pandemic. Gordy is looking forward to returning to Lake Havasu City, where he and his wife will raise their two children surrounded by family and friends. He plans to be an active member of the greater Lake Havasu community, building relationships that help support Thunderbolt Middle School's focus on the whole child. We'll entertain questions or a motion on 3.1. I move that we accept item 3.1 as presented. Seconded. Yes. 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 Mr. Rowling, now it's up to you. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. <clears throat> it is recommended that the governing board approve the proposed budget for fiscal year 2022. ARS 15-905 
requires each district to annually prepare a proposed budget no later than July 6th and furnish it to the county school superintendent and the superintendent of public instruction. After approval by the governing board, the proposed budget summaries and notice of public hearing will be published on the ADE website. The meeting to adopt the budget is scheduled for July 6th, 6, 2021. A copy of the proposed budget is before you. And also, as part of the budget presentation, uh, we started this, uh, it kind of aligned this last year um, in, in coordinating with the budget proposal of having uh, the, those who oversee certain grants within the district also present their information at this time so you can kind of get a, a very big picture as to what to expect in the year to come. So we have Michelle Yuso, Marsha Becker, and of course Aggie Walter over here uh, who will present their portion of the grants that they oversee and then following their presentation will go into my presentation for maintenance and operations and capital expenditures. Good um, evening, Mr. President and members of the Governing Board. My name is Michelle Yusom, the Grant Specialist for Lake Havis Unified School District. I mean, my name is Pete Price, if you're here at the district. I'm here today to present to you, uh, as Mr. Murray said, uh, preliminary grant applications for fiscal year 2022. So I'm going to start with Title I. I think you can see that, okay? So I'm going to go through each of the grants that I'm going to have to oversee, some of which will be switching for the new year. But um, we'll start with Title I. Title I services are economically disadvantaged students. So Title I is, we have Title I in five of our elementary, excuse me, four elementary schools in Thunderbolt. They served by Title I um, to qualify for Title I, and that's uh, be at 40% free and reduced in order to qualify for those types of funding. For the preliminary allocation for the fiscal year 22, the Department of Education has awarded this $1,201,689.26. As we go through these grants, you'll see that many of these grants fund a lot of salaries. So, for instance, Title I funds our instructional interventionist. That's for ELA and math. We have five ELA and one in math interventionist. We have 11 paraprofessionals, full-time equivalent, who support those reading interventionists and math interventionists, as well as teachers in the classroom. We also have a portion of my salary that will fall within Title I. Title I will pay for two 0.25 part-time equivalent student achievement coaches for next year. In addition, Title I pays for any substitutes. So if a, if a staff member is federally funded, Title I will pay for their substitutes for the year. And Title I will fund after-school tutoring at our five title schools as well as Title I summer school. In addition to salaries and benefits, it pays for supplemental instructional supplies for students, including technology. Also pays for parent and family engagement resources, and the indirect cost for Mojave County. That's Title I. And again, these are preliminary allocations. These are not final allocations. So roughly it's about 95% of the grant allocation has been awarded to us. Title II is our professional development grant. We were awarded $198,016.24. You can see, again, a large portion of that goes to salaries and benefits. We have 0.25 part-time equivalent student achievement coach, a half-time student achievement coach, we pay for half of the administrative assistant for student achievement. It also pays for our new teachers to attend new teacher induction, which is a week-long training for all of our new teachers coming into the district. It pays for some of our new teacher trainings as well as our principal mentor program. I know we do have two new principals coming into the district next year. And then it pays for other professional development training resources as well as the Mojave County Indirect Costs. Okay, our next one is Title III. Title III serves our EL population, our English language learner population. Our preliminary allocation for that grant is $10,809.79 um, for stipends and benefits. It doesn't pay for any salaries, but it does pay for some stipends. It pays for two teachers to host a parent and family engagement night for parents of ELs. It pays for the resources for, for that family engagement night. And it also pays for our EL summer school, which this year is taking place over at Central Elementary School. It does pay for some EL professional development, that's teacher training, so our teachers who teach those students in the classroom will provide ongoing professional development services. And then again, indirect cost to Mojave County. Title IV we've had for the last few years. Our preliminary allocation is 29500 In the last several years since we've had this grant, we have been using it to fund the Chain Reaction or Rachel's Challenge consultant, and that's geared for like Havasal High School 
students usually in the ninth or end or tenth grade. And again, we'll have it in the indirect class. Our next grant is the school safety grant. We'll be in our third year of allocation for this grant. Um, the allocation has been the same all three years, $200,504.10, and that only funds three positions. Those are three full-time equivalent um, elementary school counselors, and we'll continue to fund that for the upcoming year. Our next grant is the Arizona New Teacher Project. There's a little bit of a shift this year. This year it's going to cover one full-time equivalent master math teacher, as well as some professional development trainings and resources for the five student achievement coaches or master teachers. That's 75000 and it's uh, awarded for the next two years. There are also some new funding from the federal government. Can um, we go and a couple questions? Yes, absolutely. Just before we get to that, um, for Title I funding, um, because the USDA has extended their free lunch throughout the next year, um, we won't be having parents fill out those forms. Will that affect our Title I funding? We've already been across the state feeling that I'm going to call it pain because we don't, it's the uncertainty, we don't know. We're all in the same boat. Parents across the state are not filling out that free and reduced form. I haven't heard anything officially, but I would anticipate them leaving that for the next year at least because obviously our funding would go down because we don't, because we do have fewer students and parents filling out that form. So I've heard nothing officially yet, but that's a great question though. So, so far, I have not seen the impact our bank. And then I just have one more question. Um, so you're talking about the English um, language learner summer school. Yes. Do you have any idea how many how many students have taken have taken part in that this year? I don't have the numbers this year. I can get those for you. Um, I'll email them to Dr. Stone, and we'll make sure to get them for you. We have three. I can tell you that we have three certified teachers who are providing services to the EL teachers this summer. In the past, that's been much larger. We've always had a district-wide summer school. This year is very unique in that we have every single school, including the high school and middle school, having um, summer school. So everything is a little bit different this year, but we did we were able to get three teachers to fund um, to service our EL students at Spring Tree. In the past, we've serviced 80 to 90 students, but because we had um, the other elementary schools are also holding summer school, it, was long, it would be a long day for those students to attend regular or gen ed summer school and then additional EL summer school after. So I have a feeling those gen numbers were lower this year as compared to the previous years. Okay, thank you. Okay, on to some new funding. Um, the next three slides are going to be over the ESSER funding. And ESSER stands for the Elementary and Secondary Schools Emergency Relief Fund. All three of those uh, are funding that has come from the federal government. Um, to help us mitigate COVID-19. So I'm going to start with our first one that we received. Uh, SR1, we're going to call that. We received $952,908.99. The grant window, I put that on these next three slides so you have an idea of what these three grants will look like. All three of these grants will date back to March 13, 2020, when, when COVID-19 was identified and the funding became available. The first grant goes through September 30th, 2022, and you'll see the next couple of slides they extend a year for each grant. Again, like the previous grants, we fund some salaries. In SR1, we're paying for four part-time equivalent or half-time nurses. We're paying stipends and benefits in order to fund um, school PLP or distant learning as well as SPED. We have hired on an additional full-time equivalent computer technician, and then it's also hosting the uh, providing funding for summer school for our nine title schools, and that would be Jamaica, Starline, and Lake Council High School, which is unique. We have not had that in the past in all of my years of being with the district. It's also funding instructional supplies for students, COVID-19 cleaning stipends for staff who have put in hours above and beyond to do cleaning at their sites. It's provided a program called the Unique Learning System, an online essential learning plan, professional development for special education teachers. SR1 funded our school PLP licenses in the amount of $50-some-thousand. Uh, it's been providing our PPE, our personal protective equipment, including plexiglass, face shields, masks, and other types of devices that would be considered F, um, PPE. Technology, we have spent some money in technology to support uh, distant learning. And that included laptops, charging cards, printers, webcams, and headphones for SR1. It provided the funding for the in-touch notification system that was for parents to communicate better with our parents. And the same thing with the next line item, the COVID-19 communication flyers that would go out to the family and community. 
and again, the uh, indirect costs for Mojave County. Okay. Esther 2 came a little later. We received an allocation award of $3,955,052.63. Again, the grant was started March 13, 2020, but this one will extend to September 30th, 2023, so one additional year. You're going to see that we added some additional salaries in here. We still have the nurses. We added three full-time counselors. We are doing a full-time equivalent school psychologist, a full-time equivalent instructional technology coach. We're refunding the computer technician. The full-time equivalent community outreach coordinator will be funded under ESSER 2. A new position for the elementary assistant principal, also serving in school PLP. Right now, there's a projection of uh, we've added 15 full-time equivalent classroom teachers, and that's to reduce class size. And we'll see how that funding plays out and how many teachers we will actually need. It'll fund, again, a portion of my salary with three, three additional full-time equivalent custodians, and then we also are funding 14 part-time equivalent DBAs that I believe we're helping with uh, lunch duty. Under stipends and benefits, it's still paying for our school PLP and distant learning and summer school stipends and benefits for our non-title schools. On the second column over there, we did purchase, I believe already purchased, three school marquees to replace outdated ones to communicate with parents. Again, we pay for instructional supplies. Uh, I have classroom teachers listed there, but it's the 15 that's listed in the previous column for class size reduction. For curriculum materials, it's paid for both Amplify and Core of Knowledge curriculum that we've been purchasing. It also is funding the school PLP licenses. There was a request to add two transportation department vehicles and two technology department vehicles into this grant. Again, personal uh, PPE is added. Technology shifted just slightly. We have laptops, charging carts, network switches, and surveillance cameras. And lastly, again, Mojave County indirect costs. And then finally, S33. S33, we were awarded most recently. And this is, I think, what will probably be the last of the COVID funding from what I'm hearing. But who knows? I don't know. Uh, the allocation we were awarded was $8,941,412.18. Again, the grant window extends now to March, uh, September 30th of 2024. Now, these are proposed expenditures. Because this grant is new, it's not even due until September. Uh, so right now, these are the only proposed items that we're going through right now. So again, we're going to continue to fund the nurses, the counselors, the summer learning program. If needed, the classroom teachers for class size reduction, school PLP, the psychologist, technology, um, the technology coach, the technician. You know, see, I won't go through all of them, but really they're all the same as the rest are too. We're just going to continue to fund them for an additional year. At the top of the second column, are the school PLP license renewals by that time? We'll continue to fund curriculum materials. Technology devices uh, will be used primarily will be mobile devices or laptops for students. There will be an additional two trucks for transportation department added. PPE will be continued to fund it under uh, SR3. There is a little shift in this thing as compared to SR1 and SR2. Um, we are required to have what's called a set-aside. And this grant is requiring us to set aside 20% of the grant, or close to $1.8 million of the allocation amount, to address student learning loss. And so that's some part of the budget we're working on right now. It's to address the learning loss and the social and emotional stability of our students. And finally, again, the Mojave County indirect cost. Any questions over this ESSER grant? Yes, sir. Well, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Prior to um, COVID, we did actually have half-time nurses in our school, so we were already funding um, a half-time position. So we changed that to a full-time position in each elementary. So that's why you're seeing the fourth. So there is a full-time nurse in each school. Yeah, unfortunately, 
Yep, that's a great question because I used to oversee new teacher orientation and federal funds do not allow us to purchase food. So that's always been a struggle during new teacher orientation. So for our community or for our businesses, local businesses to continue to fund that is really important because we have a lot of teachers coming in from out of state who don't have a lot of money. They're paying their relocation fees. So if our businesses in our community can continue to support that type of lunches, we are providing, we can provide the funding for them to be paid each day that they're here. They're paid $200 a day or $1,000 for the week for attending the five days. But it really is important to have that on food money. That would be amazing. I know our PTACs, our PTAs have been very actively involved in that as well, helping to fund. Usually we have like a small breakfast uh, or snacks. Yeah. appreciate that, Helen. I really do, because in the past, when I have done the teacher education in the past, we didn't always have that kind of support we do now, so it's yeah. very much appreciated. Okay. Sure. Other questions regarding ESSA funding? Okay. Then I will get you the ELL information, and we'll see so you have that. And then turn it over to Marshall Beck, who's going to talk to you a little bit about the CPU Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board. My name is Marsha Becker. I am the CT coordinator for Lake Havasu High School and WAVE, Western Arizona Vocational Education, um, CTAD. So there are three main places that funding comes from for CTE. The first one is the CT Perkins Federal Grant. So this is a federal um, allocation. And we receive $90,551.88. Uh, this fund pays for our CT accountability specialist who is in our career center, um, half salary of our CT computer technician, our part salary of the CT preschool aide, some funding for our professional development for all CT teachers, uh, parapros, administrators, counselors, and then some supplies for CTE programs. The second fund that we have is a state fund. It is called Priority 400. Uh, the preliminary allocation is $27,105.42. This grant mainly funds our CTSOs, our career and student, uh, technical student organizations. So any student registrations or costs or travel, um, this fund can be used for that. We also use it for um, basic supplies to fund those CTE programs as well. The final uh, place for funding for, for CTE is our WAVE grant. So this is pass-through dollars that are received from um, tax funds generated from our students who take CTE classes. The zero-based budget for next year is projected to be around $673,888. Uh, this is where we have our, um, our teacher salaries from. So we have a nursing services teacher who receives salary and benefits. We have a graphic design teacher, a law and public safety teacher, salary and benefits for all of those. Uh, this year we are adding in a counselor. So this will be a CTE and LHHS counselor. Um, and CTE will pay for half of that this next year. The office assistant for CTE is paid for out of this uh, fund. Half of the CTE coordinator, or one fifth, pardon me, of the CTE coordinator's salary is paid for. Uh, there are also various stipends, so the CTSO, or C, uh, the, the teachers, the lead advisors receive a stipend uh, for advising the students throughout the year. There's a stakeholders, uh, and this year I would also like to add in some curriculum development stipends. Uh, it's a goal for us to really work on our curriculum um, and uh, make sure that we have all of our standards and uh, workplace employability places in in the viable curriculum. Uh, I've also been working with our fire department, and so there will be some funding set aside for a fire service program. This is in the works. It wouldn't start. We're projecting that to get it going in January. We'll see um, how it goes, but uh, all the talks that we've had are very promising for right now to get that going for our students. Uh, Current technical student organization travel, registrations for leadership events is also paid for out of this grant. We are planning on uh, computer, updating our software development and our allied health biology computer labs. Uh, the software development computer lab right now is 
using our old music and audio computers, which are about 10 years old, so it's time to update some of our labs. Supplies for all of our CTE programs, a lot of supplies go through uh, the, the doors of, of the various 17 programs that we have. Hardware and software to maintain the rigorous standards and curriculum that we have. And then some 8th grade day promotional supplies. Uh, sometimes we can also fund uh, if 8th grade middle school students need supplies of some sort um, to support the curriculum that they have. Are there any questions that I can answer for you? You got how many years out of those computers? Ten. Well, I think, I, don't quote me, um, it's coming up to 10 years, I believe, for the music and audio programs. If you remember last um, June, I came to you and asked to replace those computers, uh, and they were repurposed into our software development program, and so now they're starting to fail, and it's time to move them I'm surprised anything lasted 10 years. I am too. <laughs> we, yeah, normally uh, working with the tech department, they every five years is, is when we have to think about replacing. So. I have a question. So some of the CTE classes have fees that we um, allocate to the students. Those fees will remain in place, right? This funding does it, does it change that? That's right. Those fees will remain in place. And those fees, uh, it depends on the program, um, you know, for for our automotive and for cabinet making classes, it's just it supplies. There's a lot of pieces of, of wood or screws or whatever it is that they need to have to make those projects. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much. And over to Ms. Walter. Mr. President, members of the board, I'm going to go over the different budgets we have within the special services or student services, I should say now, or change, that we oversee. Our main grant that most of you are familiar with is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Basic Act, and it is the grant that pretty much funds the additional staff that we need to support. Um, in addition to the funds we spend in the middle budget to make sure that we're able to meet the needs of our students that require that free appropriate public education um, and related services from their IEPs. We fund two full-time special education teachers on assignment who work very closely with all teachers and support staff in the district, but working with our special education teachers and the general education teachers to be able to meet their needs the different programs that we do have. It also funds the preschool coordinator. That's my pre-developmental preschool. We have two clerical staff that work to support our program that are funded out of the ground. And we also have two full-time health office support staff that work in the schools to support the nurses at the middle school and the high school. A lot of students go through those programs. And then we have seven full-time care professionals paid out of the ground and 14.325 personal care assistants. The difference there is our students that are in our more intensive program require personal care support in addition to their educational needs, and there is a difference in the training required to the staff. And we also um, fund 0.925 of the speech assistant. We are also obligated to set aside proportionate share funding based on the identifications of children that attend our private schools and homeschool, and so those funds come out of that grant as well. We also fund the hourly time card staff that do interpreting to ensure that our parents are able to meaningfully engage in meetings. We also purchase materials and supplies that are supplemental to the program, the general curriculum. And then any professional development um, travel and training that our staff are needing to attend, we can fund for the training and cover the cost related to that, and also the substitutes that are related to that. We pay for the daily substitutes for all staff that are within the grant being funded, so that is coming out of this as well. And then it does fund um, 0.6 of my salary as well. We have stipends that we do um, issue throughout the year to support tutoring and after-school intervention programs that may be needed, like during the summer programs, which we also know is our ESY program. We have tutoring, again, each individual needs, we provide that through a stipend process as well. And any contracted transportation services for students who may not be able to utilize our special education bus that may require um, shuttle services, 
because we do have other programs like our district office learning lab students that are attending, and that's all paid through the grant as well. And of course, the indirect costs that were obligated to the county. Any questions on the ID staff? Do you have a speech therapist? <laughs> um, we pay for a speech assistant out of the grant, but we do have multiple speech therapists that are funded out of our maintenance and operation budget. That's great news because that's a hard position to find somebody for. Yes, it is, and always all the related service providers are becoming more difficult to, to find these days. Our next grant is the preschool grant, which is um, identified specifically for our three to five-year-olds, which we do service at Smoke Tree Developmental Preschool. And that does fund a quarter of the salaries and benefits of our preschool administrative assistant. We purchase materials and supplies, and then non-instructional supplies. We do have a lot of child find obligations. We do those community outreach, and that allows us to pay for the paper and the information, flyers, and advertisement we may need to do. And then we also have an obligation to do an annual assessment, which is the teaching strategies bill. We're able to utilize the grant to fund that as well. And then, of course, indirect cost. First things first is our preschool scholarship program that we will be bringing to the board next month um, once we have that contract renewal. Um, we are awarded scholarships, and it actually supports the Little Knights program as well. We actually fund um, a full-time preschool with the Little Knights program, and we fund one preschool paraprofessional. That's my true developmental preschool, and then again, it does help to cover half the cost of the administrative assistant who does handle all that paperwork that comes with dealing with that program, which is a lot of paperwork on a monthly basis. We also purchase instruction materials and supplies and snacks. We do provide daily snacks at our preschool program as part of that, and that is provided at no cost to parents. Then again, the teaching strategy goal for the students who are attending on scholarship. And then stipends for additional duties that may be needed in reporting and training. We also can fund and do fund professional development as staff needs come up as well to that grant. Any questions on the post events? The next two budgets are not grant, but they are public school programs, um, Medicaid in the public school known as MIPS and MAC. Um, that is a reimbursement program that students who are receiving related services, including transportation and therapies, are eligible for a partial reimbursement. This is an estimated of reimbursement cost, because again, from year to year, it does vary based on the students who qualify for that program. We are expecting it to be around 195,000 for this next school year for the direct service. And that does fund one full-time assistant who oversees the Medicaid billing part of that program, ensuring compliance, and then part of the preschool assistant as well. So the stipends that we do fund, we have a lead nurse stipend, which is very important to support our nurses, especially with the increased number of nurses. And that does account for some of the additional duties and responsibilities and extra after hours that definitely came in reality with COVID and will continue as we anticipate some changes moving forward. We also pay for the speech license renewals with the Department of Health Services for our speech therapists, so they are required to be licensed through both entities. And then um, we do pay a fee for the Medicaid billing and any instructional materials and supplies that we may need that we have not budgeted into our other resources. Um, we're also able to purchase capital items like equipment that may not be able to be approved through the other grants, through the Medicaid that go directly to support our students in special education. And assistive technology that may be needed. That is pretty much anything that helps a student, like a computer, augmented communication devices that may not be qualified through some of the other state agencies. We're able to use these funds if it's determined to be needed by their IEP. The MAP program is estimated to generate around 25000 That is a fund that is tied to our staff who are directly involved in helping to get families connected to the resources that they need. So it's that identification. And so it is a salary study that they do as far as a draw random moment sampling. Um, we are able to fund our discipline hearing officer through that funding source. And again, um, part-time administrative assistance support with the disciplinary hearings. And any salaries and benefits we do have at this time, 
1.925 full-time personal care attendants that we're paying for, and then the daily stuff related to that stack that are funded through that profile. Are there any questions? It's a lot to take in, but um, we're excited. The opportunities that the grants do allow us to do, and again, in special education, those are in addition to our obligations, we can't supplant, meaning we can't take these funds and replace funds from the maintenance and operation budget, but it's for those additional costs over, because we know our students with special needs do cost us more to be able to address their educational needs. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Murray if there's any more questions. Mr. President, members of the board, this portion is the uh, generally the it's, it's basically the maintenance and operation portion and capital expenditures portion. There are some repages in here that also do reference uh, all the different funds that do pass through the district as well. So again, per statute, as stated in the action item, uh, this is a mandatory process where we do present. The annual financials uh, at this point is the proposed budget. And then again, as stated, uh, there will be the adoption period uh, where you will take action of some kind on July 6th. The budget presentation will um, go through these, uh, these specific areas, the budget forms, reports, uh, average daily membership. The big one is calculations, budget expenditures, and then at the end, any questions that you might have, as well as it does, we do always reference the website where you can find the report, so that way the public does have that access to this information. The budget forms, uh, this is year two of this update. Uh, in years past, there was actually two totally separate uh, Excel spreadsheets and reporting uh, tools that were used. Uh, last year, the I believe it was the Auditor General's office um, took those forms and combined them together, which made it, um, it was actually, some people liked it, some people didn't like it. I, I actually prefer this because it's all in one location. Uh, I don't have to um, make sure that, that both documents are talking to each other, and it's just easier to reference and refer from tab to tab to tab versus multiple uh, spreadsheets. So this is a, uh, an extended screenshot of what it looks like um, and then shrunk down so it fits on, on a slide. But you can see there are many data points and cells in which um, after looking at many, many reports and, and inputting the data where it belongs, uh, the main thing, I was on the radio earlier today, I can't, I can't stress it enough that uh, we as a district uh, are very much tied to formulas. So everything within our budget, um, talking about the general budget, is tied to average daily membership, about the students who are enrolled in our district. Uh, once we have that number, um, and now thanks to current year funding, uh, our projected number, everything is then calculated through formulas and through uh, these many cells that talk to each other. Uh, it, it comes out with a general budget limit dollar amount, and that's what we budget for. So the reports um, that we pull from, you can see the just small screenshots of, of the, some of the reports that uh, are used to populate what's before you. And these are all, uh, they all come from the state. And they are also available uh, for anybody to view on the Department of Ed website. And you can see them not just for our district, but for every district. So the fun part of beginning to put all of this together, I, I find it pretty fascinating. Um, for others, it might be boring, but it is kind of interesting to see how you can pull from multiple sources of data and then come up with uh, an actual budget limit that we are tied to. 
So average daily membership, now again, thanks to current new funding, we do have to look at reports of the 100th day past, so 100th day numbers that happened in January. Uh, we look at that and we keep, we keep an eye on the reports that continually run from the Department of Ed month after month after month. Um, there tends to be a little bit more stabilization as we get into May and June with that number. They, they seem to start to reconcile the movement of kids from, from district to district uh, because that, that does play into our average daily membership count. Uh, there is a possibility where you could have concurrent enrollments where you have a student who's attending the Lake Havasu Unified School District, but also um, being claimed at another school district because the paperwork has not yet complete, been completed. So you could have multiple districts actually receiving monies for that same student until all of that is worked out and reconciled. And a lot of times that doesn't even fully uh, reconcile until well into September and even October. Uh, and then, of course, we're three months into the new fiscal year at that point. So you can see on, on this uh, worksheet that uh, this is, again, just screenshots of the main budget forms that you have in front of you and which will be uploaded on our website as well as the Department of Ed. You can see that from the APOR uh, ADM 46-1 report, you can see that the 100th day numbers currently on that report are those in which the little red arrows are pointing to for the preschool, K through 8, and 9 through 12 students. And then you can see in the greenish color box where it says current year ADM, these are budgeted proposed numbers. So these are, these are proposals at this particular time but based on the data that we have before us. Uh, Terry on a pretty much weekly basis. It's getting better now that we, uh, as we get AAs back in the building, she'll get more accurate information as in the coming weeks. Um, but we receive information uh, as much of in real time as possible to make predictions as to what our enrollment will look like uh, next year. So in speaking with Mrs. Walter, she has she is seeing a slight increase in, in the preschool numbers. So we are budgeting for 30 individuals there. And then you can see that we have 3,370 students K-8 and 1,780 students in grades 9 through 12. And we're looking at uh, pre-pandemic numbers at this point because we are seeing um, and most of the reports that, that we have been looking at, we are seeing an increase in enrollment and interest in coming back to the district. So we, we're trying to be conservative yet, but a little bit optimistic in making sure that we set our numbers at a, at an, a reasonable rate so that we can also set our property tax levy at a reasonable rate as well. We don't want to go into levying for taxes with some really unrealistic number and create a bunch of tax revenue that's just not accurate. Uh, I mean, I could put 100 preschool students if I wanted to and 10,000 9 through 12th grade students if we wanted to generate a bunch of tax revenue um, through the levy, um, but that just doesn't, that's just not going to be accurate. So we're trying to be as accurate as, as possible to make sure that we're levying for uh, the dollar amount that will allow us to pay our bills. So it must be reasonable, and these are, these are reasonable predictions and proposals at this time. The next page, uh, again, part of this whole process, this is part of the data page, um, going back to that slide where you saw the big screenshots of the, the long um, budget spreadsheets. Uh, these are blown up portions of that. You can see in the yellow boxed area that per what is anticipated to be the approved budget for next year in the state legislature because this is what has been talked about and before the legislative body, that, that dollar amount of $4,390.65 is what is supposed to be voted on. And in, in talking to others throughout the state, this is what most people are levying on. Um, because 
they still haven't passed the budget, and this at some point needs to go to the county so they can set property tax valuations or levy rates and start collecting tax revenue. If we, if we use the current year um, budgeted uh, number, the base support number, uh, we can under levy, and then we have potentially a cash flow problem going into next year. Uh, you can see that arrow going down. The box number two is checked for um, the district has an approved has approved been approved for additional monies for teacher compensation. Uh, what that means is, and I've mentioned this before, the district and most districts in the state have a teacher evaluation mechanism that's approved by the state. So if we have a teacher evaluation tool, which we do and most do. Um, that is approved by the state, then we receive an additional 1.25% to that base support level. So that brings it to $4,445.53 per weighted student count. That little section in, uh, down at the bottom, that third area, where I have the .9908 number circled, this is the teacher experience index. So every year the personnel department uh, tabulates and, and calculates the years of experience that all of our teachers have. Uh, number of teachers who were in year one of experience, year two, year three, all the way down to 30 some years of experience. Uh, there's numbers in each of those areas. That's calculated out and compared to the state average. And then whatever that average is out to be in comparison to the state, that produces a teacher experience index for our district. So one being the average, once it's all calculated, you can see we're just under that. So we do not benefit from having to receiving additional monies because our teacher experience is above the state average. Uh, they give you a little bit more based on how much, how much larger that number is above the 1.0 because they're figuring that you have to pay higher salaries for those teachers who are more experienced. So because we are not at the 1.0, we're actually a little bit under the, the average in the state. We're not penalized for that. I don't have to multiply it out by 0 .9908 and we lose money. We just we multiply it out at a 1.0 and we're, we, we don't lose anything, which is, which is nice. So there's no penalty in having a teacher experience index that's lower than the average. On the, next, on the next page is the calculation, more calculations from one of the tabs in that budget spreadsheet. This uh, has to do with totaling out and coming up with weighted student count so that I can multiply that against the base support level. So factoring in all of the numbers from various reports within the state, you can see that green rectangle for fiscal year 21-22. That's the proposed numbers that I spoke of earlier, reasonable proposals for how many students we could have in each of those grade bands. You can see the numbers then going down vertically in the green square. You can see the numbers 30, 3370, totaling the 5180 vertically. And then going horizontally across the page, you can see in that black box where the state actually allows for a weighted um, a weighted factor for each of those kids. So they're saying that a preschool student, you're going to get a 1.45 multiplier so that they're basically saying that it costs a little bit more to educate a preschool student, a, a three-year-old. There's a little bit more involved, as Ms. Walter said, you have everything from um, instructional aids and snacks and everything that goes with trying to keep a little guy's attention uh, at, that, at that particular age. And then the other grade bands also have a, a little bit higher than a 1.0 multiplier. The far right side shows that if we have 30 students at a 1.45 multiplier, that's the equivalent of 43 and a half students. So because of the multipliers, um, while we might have 5,180, we call it belly buttons in the district, the, av the weighted count really calculates out to 6,203. So that helps us in the funding mechanism when you multiply that against the base support level. And you'll see where all this comes together here in the, in the next few slides. The bottom portion is um, projected counts for those students who are in K-3 classes 
You get a little extra weighted support for K-3 students for reading and instruction. And then you also have those uh, students who require additional resources. Um, we mentioned ELL earlier today. Um, but then you also have some special, special resources there for students who may have disabilities or, or learning um, challenges that require extra supports. And they also receive a little heavier weight to allow us to educate them, a um, little extra dollars to help educate them as it's a little bit more expensive to educate someone who has some learning challenges or behavioral challenges. So if you take the 6203 plus the 807 down there for the additional, they call it group B weights, you add those together, that is your total weighted student count. So may I ask just one question on that? You bet. Uh, I'm just curious with the 574, what is the DDED, MIIDSLD, SLIs? So those are all, uh, all of you, Ms. Walter, <laughs> sure. Sure. We're dealing with developmental disabilities, emotional disability, mild intellectual disability, specific learning disability, speech language impairment, and other health impairment. Those are considered um, minor areas of disabilities. We okay. find that a much lower rate. So on the next slide, you see, again, calculations where we take those numbers, put them together. Like I just mentioned, we now have 7,010.197 of total weighted student count. Multiply that with the base support, including that teacher compensation of 1.25. Uh, that generates real quickly uh, a budgeted amount of $31 million at that point. So you can see right here, I think this is the, the really one of the most important pages and something the community really needs to understand, and we try to articulate that, that it's not about pulling a number out of the air. It's, it's literally tied to, to kids and the, the number of students and their support needs um, multiplied by the number established by the state. It's not established by the local district. This is established by the state. Um, generates our, what will ultimately be the general budget limit, and that's the amount that we have to stay within. If you look down uh, at the bottom of that page, you can see there's the 1.0 multiplier for teacher experience index. We did not take a, there's no penalty for being under the 1.0, so we simply multiply it by 1.0. So 31 million times one is 31 million. Um, it stays the exact same. Years ago, we had a slight increase in TEI, so we had something a little bit above 1.0. So it's, in the past, we've picked up a hundred and some thousand dollars additional for having experience that was greater than 1.0. Usually the dollar amount's not that big, but 140 some thousand dollars is 140 thousand dollars. So it is important that we, uh, that we keep an eye on that. Again, more calculations, so you can see that 31 million carried forward. We do, um, we are able to be reimbursed for our annual, but or our annual financial audits. So you can see that we put that into the budget. It increases that dollar amount, and then at the bottom of that page, the bottom section, you see that new dollar amount of 31.2, and then we add in what we receive by way of transportation revenue uh, or the revenue control limit. This number is based on student ride, like ridership, um, mileage driven. Uh, there's a couple different multipliers in that area in calculating this out. But that $901,444.69, that, that is a number that we had years and years ago. And at some point, well before I got here, uh, it was determined that there would be no penalty that that if your calculations came in below that number, that you would take that hit. So we were grandfathered in to keep that higher dollar amount. Uh, right now, if we were to calculate that out, we would probably be a couple hundred thousand below that number at this particular time. So it is nice that we are able to keep that, that dollar amount and gives us a little bit extra uh, in our general budget limit or budget capacity. And being in rural Arizona, we could use it because most of our teams are traveling three hours away. Uh, we can use every bit of that. 
The next page is, again, more calculations for district additional assistance, which um, we have always used for capital. Uh, you can see that um, the green circles up at the top, district additional assistance is based on the prior fiscal year, so the 100th day numbers of this year, so the numbers from January. They're used to calculate district additional assistance, um, override calculations, for example. So that's why the numbers you see there are different than the proposed 30 preschool students. This is actual 100-day numbers that we're using. And you can see that each of those groups are multiplied. Um, they have those multipliers there of $450.76 for preschool to eight, and $492.94, again established by the state, for nine through 12 students. And once it all calculates out, if you look at the very bottom right-hand corner where I have the red circle, uh, we, we come up with about 2.3, just under $2.4 million in, a, in district additional assistance. The line just above that, uh, this is, we haven't seen this in a long time, a number of years. You see that it's all zeros all the way across, just above that red circle. And it says over on the far left, DAA adjustment. For many, many years, um, and there's a slide right there, a little, little, uh, what do you call it, little table there that I put in there to show history. Um, we have had adjustments to DAA for many years. Uh, several, just probably actually three years ago, it was an 85% reduction. So our district additional assistance adjustment was at 85%. So. You can see on that historical data there in, in fiscal year 18, we were only, we were only getting $316,000 in district additional assistance, which is our capital money. And it's hard, it would be impossible to maintain the amount of square footage that we have with $316,000 on an annual basis. You know, we have 40 air conditioners on, on one building at an, air, at an elementary school alone. Um, Three hundred sixteen thousand dollars. That's just that's just air conditioning units on one building. Uh, you're talking about transportation and technology needs and supports. There's no way that you could keep your capital, you keep ahead of your capital needs with that amount of money. And then you can see the fiscal year 19, 20, 21, 22. Uh, this is the first year going back to that adjustment where there is no adjustment. So the state, at the moment, they haven't approve the, the actual budget yet, but uh, all indications say that they're going to hold true to that and there will be no reduction. So what we qualify for is what we would receive. So calculating the override, which I just mentioned, we do use um, prior fiscal year numbers, so 100th day numbers uh, from back in January. You can see that dollar amount, or that number there, 6,549.087 students, multiplied by the proposed current year, um, what's hopefully soon to be adopted budget of $4,445.53. The TEI, Teacher Experience Index, still at 1.0. And you can see as you we look down at auditing expenses, all of that taken into consideration with the 15% Voter approved override uh, that generates approximately $4.5 million for this year in the override um, dollar amount. So, this is where it all comes together, and we start to then have a budget form that says this is our budget capacity. So, on page seven of the report that goes to the state, that's also in front of you. Um, You'll see here it's a shrunk down version. I took out other areas where we have zeros in those sections uh, so I can get it onto a slide. But you can see there, there's your $30,107,486 number. Um, it actually was total of $32,107,48, or $32,000, $32,107,48 in taking two million of that and putting it to capital. Um, that, allows, that allows for the remaining 30 million to be an M&O. 
And then if you go down and see the $4.5 million figure there for the override, there's at the moment an anticipated um, overage or carry forward of $5.6 million in carry forward, $352,000 for Prop 123. It gives us a budget limit of $40 million, $40.5 million, basically. Um, and then the column B is for capital. The $2 million pushed over uh, from m and an additional $2.3 million for DAA on that calculations page a couple of slides ago. Gives us uh, additional revenue of $4.3 million to our capital budget. So looking at that m and um, column, column A, on page one of the forms here, the yellow tab, you can see that that $40 million, that $40.5 million is, in fact, in the bottom right-hand corner. That's where all of our budget, that's our budget limit, or our budget uh, capacity, and all of our figures populated within this spreadsheet total, that $40 million figure. So we do reconcile with the state showing, or on the form showing, that we are qualified for $40 million, $40.5 $40. million, basically, $40.6 million, and we are budgeting to that. So at the bottom there, you see that little little tagline that says the district has budgeted an amount in the m and fund equal to the general budget limit as calculated on page 7 of 8. If we did not do that, it would say that we didn't do that, and it would give me a dollar amount. It would say that you you misbudgeted by a hundred thousand dollars or whatever it is. You either budgeted more than or under, and then it would cause me to go back to reconcile that if I wanted to. I, I don't have to if I don't want to, but I don't I don't think uh, it's good business sense to leave money on the table or over budget. Um, so we're, we're we make sure we budget to the penny. I'm going back to that, too, just real quick because I know we have a couple new board members. So if you look at the very bottom of that page, I just, I've done this in the past, and I just want to make sure that I, I throw that on there. The, the template to our presentation uh, has changed a little bit, so I have purple on the right and a purple triangle on the left, so I have to kind of squeeze things in there, and a tagline on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so I had to squeeze this in as best I could. So... Just to give you some examples, in the 6100 column, you're looking at salaries, stipends, those types of things in 6100. So an object code of 6100 um, addresses salaries. In the 6200 column, where it says employee benefits, you're, you're looking at numbers that are, that are reconciling to or budgeting for medical insurance, other employment benefits such as Social Security, retirement, long-term disability, workers' comp. So all of the, that column is addressing your uh, the employee's benefits of some kind. Purchase services in the 6300, 6400, and 6500. Examples of that would be our ESI employment staffing services. So when we have to uh, pay for substitute teachers, they're purchase services. They're not employees. So the budgeted line, the budgeted numbers in that column um, can be employee uh, staffing services, can be contracting uh, services for staff. Uh, I know Mrs. Walter from time to time uh, needs to contract with other providers to provide um, speech therapy or we, we're, we're looking for a speech therapist or a psychologist or, or an OTPT person because we just can't find someone and hire them within, so sometimes we have to contract outside of the district. So those would be some examples also in that 63, 64, 6500 um, column. 6600 is pretty self-explanatory. We're talking about supplies, um, but we're also talking about, it's not just paper and pencil, uh, we're also talking about fuel, um, electricity, gas, you know, those types of expenses as well. And then in 6800, um, very few items uh, actually fall into that. Debt service falls into that, but typically debt service will also come out of a different fund. It's fund 700, but 6800 is an object for, for debt service. But we primarily see an m and um, pertains to dues and fees. So if we're paying for 
some type of uh, a fee to get into a certain event for uh, a conference, a field trip, something along that line. Mostly, though, we, we talk about dues belonging to a professional organization like uh, Arizona School Boards Association uh, will come out of as a, as a due or a fee in the 6800 group. So budgeted expenditures um, continuing. It's the green tab on the state budget form for capital. Um, as going back to a few slides ago, you can see that uh, $5.6 million dollars we're anticipating um, 3.5 million in expenses to finish out this fiscal year. And then you see the two numbers uh, shown on the page seven of the budget of the 2.1 million and the 4.3 million in additional revenue would give us a total budget capacity in capital for next year, this fiscal year that we're talking about um, at 6.5 million. So budget expenditures, this is just a, a horizontal look of that $6.5 million, seeing it broken out into, again, much like the 6100, 6200 chart, uh, the columns, the vertical columns, you can see uh, where, the, uh, where the budgeted expenditures are actually sitting at this particular time. The main thing that we must look at and always keep our eye on is that $6.5 million number. Our, our decisions can change during the year, and what we think we're going to expend right now may be different three months from now. So that's all allowable. What needs to stay in check is the budget capacity. That's what we're always looking at. We want to make sure we're not overexpending that $6.5 million. This, this slide is a little different this year. Um, it's the red tab in the... Uh, state budget form, you'll probably recall those who have been here for a little while that classroom site funds, it used to be a much bigger page because there were three sections. There was fund 11, fund 12, and fund 13. Um, that changed this year uh, in the legislative body this year for next fiscal year, the fiscal year we're talking about right now. It will be one fund, so it will now be just fund 10. So there's no more taking three different taking money and dividing it into three different uh, funds. 40% had to go to fund 12, 40% went to fund 13, and the 20 and 20% 20 of the dollar amount allotted went to fund 11 in the past. Now it's all 100% in fund 10. And you can see that based on in that lower left corner, um, the calculation of, of our um, ADM, times the $733, which is uh, the number for this particular fiscal year in 22. That number will change in 23 most likely because there, were, there is some one-time um, injection of funds into Fund 10 because I believe they, they mentioned that the state revenue was higher than anticipated, uh, especially during the pandemic. So they allowed for uh, a little bit more of an injection of funds there per, per pupil for this next fiscal year. So you can see that we're anticipating a budgeted expenditure or budget capacity of about $5.1 million for classroom site, site fund disbursements for next year. So then on the purple tab, uh, and again, your budget forms that go to the state, this is just a quick summary of a lot of what was presented uh, earlier just before me in uh, different federal uh, grants and state projects, other funds that we manage on the far right side of the page. This is just budget capacity. It doesn't mean that we're spending to that or even have a plan to spend to do that it's in some of these areas at this moment, but it's budget capacity. It's monies that we um, either typically spend, uh, especially like food service. Food service is revenue in, expenditures out. Um, but some of these other funds are actual monies that are sitting in the fund to date. Um, and, and those are addressed as there are needs and plans to um, be able to appropriately use some of those funds. The second to last slide is the 
title or the cover page of the state form. This is the page that probably most people take a glance at, and some people never even get past the cover page, but this is the cover page that does that shows some information on there. It does show the proposed uh, levy rates for next year. Uh, these are still um, projected at this particular time. The county still has to finish out their fiscal year and then look at whatever monies we still currently have in our debt service funds and cash on hand at the county. And then that can also affect the rates up or down. Uh, but we feel that this is a, a, a pretty close indicator of, of what they will look like uh, for next year. Again, the, and the county needs to adopt and approve our levy rates anyways. And then you can see just below that, you can see where we do reconcile. So there's the budgeted expenditures against the budget limit. Again, it's, it's dollar for dollar in, in your maintenance and operation and unrestricted capital. We didn't leave any money there to, uh, to get lost. We, we accounted for every bit of it and we reconcile to that point. And you can see at the bottom right-hand corner, a uh, number of years ago, it's required that we post, that all districts post their average teacher salary information on their website. It's also included on the cover page here. Um, just want to point out that uh, I was on the phone with an auditing consultant a couple of days ago, and just really having a bear of a time with putting these numbers down because they're so fluid. And there's no guidance from the state. There's no form or formula or direction from them. They just want average teacher salary. Well, you know as well as I do, that changes from year to year to year. You know, we could have 15 teachers at the top of the salary. I mean, just making um, a, a salary that is much more than our entry-level teachers. But then you have those 10 of them retire. And then now you have the throws your averages off if you look at everybody and get an average from from all 280 teachers. It can, it can change. Year after year after year it changes. So on here, and if you were to calculate it out that way, there's some years where it looks good that everybody got something, that your average went up, and then the next year it looks like you went backwards, but you didn't. Everyone still, as the board approved a couple months ago, Everyone still received a thousand dollar base increase to their salary, regardless of who stays and who leaves the district. Everyone got a thousand dollar base increase when you're talking a teacher. So for those who stayed, their salaries went up um, in proportion to what they made. So what in talking to her, she said districts do in all different ways, and some of them just update it as they get the new budget form from the AG's office. So in the comment section there, you can see this is based on fiscal year 20 AG report for average teacher salary, plus the 1% increase for FY21 um, and a $1,000 base increase in FY22. Um, this does not include classroom site funds. So on the annual AG report, they calculate out how much your average teacher is making based on all stipends, they take everything into account. We didn't do that in the past because we were just trying to be really to the point. This is our base salary, nothing added to it. But it, like I said, it, it, there's just there's so many moving targets and it, it, things just move all the time. So for this one, I pulled the AG report. I looked at what our FY 20 numbers, because that was the latest report. We'll get the FY21 numbers probably in February of next year, and we'll update it as we go from here on out. And it may go up and it may go down, just giving you warning, because it's not going to be an accurate representation of what we actually give, what you approve in the compensation package, and then who stays and who leaves the district. It just It's not going to be a true picture of increases. It's not. So just in just in documenting that, this is how we're coming up with that number. And it does show the $1,000 base increase um, right there and reflects the 2% uh, based on the AG's Auditor General's numbers. And then obviously the last page is always, this is just the, the uh, screenshot of um, 
website information on where you can find the information. Uh, this proposed budget will be uploaded to the website within the next few days. It won't be there in 10 minutes, more than likely, so within the next few days it'll be there. Uh, we typically put the PowerPoint presentation there as well to support it, to just give you as much information as you need. Um, and then you can obviously see this on ADE's website as well. So the Department of Ed will also have exactly what we have posted on our website. And that will happen uh, more than likely tomorrow. So sometimes there's glitches and it may take many hours to finally get it onto the ADE's website, but the goal is tomorrow. Any questions? For the average teacher salary, um, do those numbers include the entire employment package? So things like health benefits and workers' comp and that, those types of things? You know, in, in looking at how the AG calculates it, that's something that I'm, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into. From my understanding, it is just compensation when it comes to the 6,100 salaries tab. But I need to, I need to clarify that. So the number on this page does not include those types of things. All it is is just what's on the AG's report at this point. So uh, I can tell you that the, on the Auditor General's report, there's a number of line graphs, um, line data, and one of them says uh, with classroom site funds and the other is not with classroom site funds, so I know that's broken out, and the numbers on here do not reflect classroom site funds 301. So that would be in addition to these numbers. But I, I can get that information. I think many of us are kind of scrambling to try to just, I, I even went as far as just trying to just find the top teacher, the one who's making the most, and then the entry-level teacher, finding the average between the two of them, and here it is. But again, that, that's going to change next year. If that person retires, the next one, and if the next one in line is making three thousand dollars less, let's say, then that's going to that's going to change these numbers drastically. I think any math teacher would tell you that if you use mean, median, or mode, you get very different pictures of what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I did have one more question. I'm referring back to the yellow tab page, which I know I say this every time, but I do love the tabs. Um, so thank you, Naomi. I'm sure you had something to do with that. Um, it talks about kind of the percentage change um, this year versus the prior year, and I wanted to highlight a couple of changes. Um, one is that instructional staff, um, their percentage has increased by 13%. That's for general instruction. And then special ed instruction has, it looks like, if I'm reading this correctly, it looks like their percentage has increased by about 25%. Correct. Um, so I think that that is good news. That's always money well spent. There is a large reduction for the general administration staff. It's, um, it looks like a decrease of about almost 12% over last year. Um, can you tell me the reason for that decrease? So decreases um, can happen on, on movement. So, for example, we, when you have a, an individual who um, separates from the district, and then they're replaced at a much lower rate uh, salary. Uh, that drastically can, can swing it based on the number that's, that's there. So in that case, we have a relatively smaller number, $1 million versus $15 million for your instructional staff. But I, I don't have – I can sit here and tell you at this moment that there are three things that impacted that 11-point swing or the reduction. I, I can find out for you. Do we need a motion? I move that we present or uh, accept the uh, proposed budget as presented. I second. Yes. 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 Mr. you got one more thing on my thing. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President, members of the board. It is recommended the governing board call for a public hearing on July 6, 2021. 
The governing board is asked to approve a call for a public hearing to be held on July 6, 2021 at 6 p.m. to present the adoption present for adoption the 2021-22 proposed budget for consideration of the residents of the district. I move that we uh, accept item 3.3 as presented. I'll second. Yes. 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 That's all the items you have under action items. Announcements, I've only got one uh, future board meeting that everybody needs to know about. At July 6th at uh, 6 p.m. right here. Are there any uh, other questions for the uh, press? No? Okay. And now I'll uh, take a motion for you to I move that we adjourn. A second. Yes. 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 We're still here, yes. <laughs>